Thank you so much. It is great to be here at the Ritz-Carlton in Amelia Island today. It's beautiful outside. It was cold and rainy in Oklahoma when I left this morning, so really grateful to be here. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about our bank story. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, it's, you know, bios can be very linear, um, but I just want to give a little bit of the background because I think it talks a little bit about our bank and it parallels with our bank story um, pretty well. I grew up uh, really poor in eastern Oklahoma in a town that um, struggles, has tripled the unemployment rate of the rest of the state, and Oklahoma always has about double the unemployment rate of the nation. Um, and wasn't, college wasn't in my future. Um, I um, wasn't encouraged to do so. That wasn't an expectation either in school or in my family. And I had a single dad, and I worked at the grocery store um, during high school. And I would carry groceries out for um, many leaders of our community. But the one that stood out the to me the most was um, Lurleen Mabry. And she was the chairwoman of the bank, um, Citizens Bank, in Mulgee, Oklahoma. And every time I took Mrs. Mabry's groceries out, she would ask me where I was going to college, if I had an academic bowl or a, a cheerleading camp that I needed to go to, Mrs. Mabry would come in and pay for that camp, but then she'd hold me accountable next time she saw me carrying out her groceries, asking if I'd taken the ACT, um, where was I going to school. And so I did enroll in Oklahoma State University. I went to school there um, without any support for my family. Ran out of money, ended up joining the Army um, and serving as an engineer in the Army for four years in the Oklahoma Army National Guard. Um, I end up um, coming back out of the Army. All my money is direct deposited into Citizens Bank of Edmond, where I work now, which is kind of odd. And I thought I had saved up about $20,000 and was ready to go back to Oklahoma State in style. And I write a check of one of my family members took me shopping and I gained some weight. The Army carbs you up quite a bit. And my check, I got a notice that my account was overdrawn, that I didn't have $20,000 in my account, that in fact it was all gone. And this family member that had taken me shopping had spent every dollar that I had. And so I went to do the local library, got one of those big college books, uh, found a school in South Texas, in Kingsville, Texas, that would give me a full ride. I basically hitchhiked down to South Texas. You might know where Kingsville, Texas is. Um, so three hours south of San Antonio, Texas is really far. And um, I walk into the ROTC department, and the first person I meet is my husband, Marcus, so who I now have three children with. So that all worked out really well. Um, and then I am. Um, we, we get stationed in Hawaii. I, uh, my, my mom at this time marries into the family that owns part of Citizens Bank of Edmond. I come back to Oklahoma, start working in the bookkeeping department at Citizens, and apply for my dream job at the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. It was right when hotjobs.com and monster.com had just come out, and was part of the management development program at the Kansas City Fed for 10 years. Managed everything from public affairs, HR, financial management, ultimately ended up managing all the distributed systems for check services throughout the Federal Reserve. Um, including Check 21 and, and, um, and all the consolidations of all the check processing sites that was in my purview. Um, but what happened is that the, the Fed sent me to get my master's degree in economics into the graduate school of banking at the University of Wisconsin. And there I fell in love with community banking again. And I had, had this shadow, this like ghost of Lurley Mabry that I thought of about not only did I really love this business model and how it had so much more flexibility than I thought it would, but that you could do all this community good like she did in influencing young people, businesses, um, just the culture in that community was really led by the community banker in town. So my, one of my classmates had a bank in northern Minnesota, uh, three hours north of Minneapolis in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, and recruited me to be his CFO. So I moved up to Grand Rapids in 2007, and um, I thought I would be up there for like five years with the hope that I could potentially come back to Edmond to come to Citizens Bank of Edmond. This was the same size bank, and I thought, wow, this will be a really great experience, and I could come back to Oklahoma someday. Well, I thought I would be up there for five years. I get a call two years into it in 2009 from my stepfather that the bank that was in trouble. They were the lowest rating you could be in your camel's rating system. I'm not legally, I guess, supposed to tell you what that rating is, but you guys are a smart bunch here. And so we were the lowest, and he said that he really needed me to come and work there. They gave me an offer. It's a 50% cut in pay. It's um, going from being the CFO to being assistant treasurer. Um, I was like ready to go. My husband's like, hell no, you're not going to Oklahoma. <laughs> and so we stay up in Minnesota. My stepdad flies up there and says, I really need you. Um, this, and I just felt this overwhelming kind of um, sense of duty and, and really love is probably the best word for it as far as why I wanted to come back 
to really help save this bank, knowing that it was an important institution in this community, just like Lurleen's Citizens Bank and Omulgee was important to me. So 2009, don't have to really tell you guys what happened there, but in Oklahoma, we actually were pretty insulated from the whole financial crisis. Um, our bank was really the only bank in a metropolitan area in Oklahoma that got in any sort of trouble, and we were in the worst of it. And it was all our own doing. The economy was actually going quite well, but we were doing things really poorly. So we would have a spec uh, million dollar house that we were constructing. We had fully advanced on said house. I would drive by the house after attending a loan uh, committee meeting where the, um, the loan officer assured me that this house is beautiful, complete, and will sell in an instant as soon as we just renew this loan. And I would drive by the address and it was an empty lot. And I'd go back to committee and I would argue and they would tell me what an idiot I was and that I just didn't know the town and that this in fact was a house that the loan officer had been in and that it was beautiful and I just didn't know what I was doing. And of course the story goes on that we foreclose on the house and it's an empty lot and we take a million dollar loss. And this was a series of events that resulted in our little bank that had $30 million of capital when I got there. We had $12 million in loan losses that very first year, massive inter internal fraud, um, complete turnover of our senior team, including my stepfather. And then I was thrust as the assistant treasurer to basically leading the turnaround of this bank. We ended up leading the fastest turnaround in the nation without adding capital. Um, our bank is only, at this time, was $350 million in assets. It's owned, and it's owned the same as it was then as it is now. A third of it is owned by an employee stock ownership program, 33%. The uh, family owns about a third, and about 60 shareholders own the remaining third that have had the stock for generations. And um, so I, I knew that we did, really didn't have capital available to us. The family didn't have any money. They weren't wealthy. Um, we didn't have the ability to really draw money from the community because our bank was in trouble, and other banks were raising capital and doing it easily because they were making money, and we were having a hard sell, making so losing so much money. And, um, and then you had this ESOP, and so you couldn't leverage it. You had to be really mindful about uh, the fiduciary re duties re resulting from it. So we end up shrinking the bank from 350 million to 250 million and getting that turnaround um, by making sure our capital ratios were in check. At the same time, we have six locations spread throughout the city. I'm in Oklahoma is an affluent suburb of Oklahoma City, has about 100,000 people that live in our community. Um, Edmond is completely overbanked. I think uh, last count, I think we were at 65 different financial institutions that were in our town. At this point in time, there was about 50 of them. And our bank uh, was in the best spots in town at six locations. They were spread out about two and a half miles from each other. And we had 125 employees back then. Right now we have one location, which I'll get into that story a little bit, and we have 55 employees, so we've gone down 70 people, and then we're back up to 300 million of assets um, after shrinking to the 250 million. And so I was at a conference I paid for myself to go back in 2012, and I was sitting in a social media session, and I was really trying to just find, get in touch with the outside world again. I've, those of you that have been part of a bank turnaround know you're very internally focused. I was just trying to see the world and, and kind of get out of my shell for a little bit. Well, I went to the session and it was on Twitter and it was about how you could use Twitter to increase your, your search engine optimization. And back then, if you searched for Citizens Bank of Edmond or even Bank Oklahoma, you would see stories about my bank that were not very favorable um, because the unpopular stories you get a lot of hits and increase your search engine optimization. Well, what I was hearing was that if I got on Twitter, I could potentially manipulate that so that people saw the story and wanted them to see. In the middle of the session, I get a call from the state banking department telling us that we're released from the written agreement. I go back into the session. Within a couple minutes of getting released from a written agreement, I join Twitter. And at this time, too, the bank has a terrible reputation, but I also have a terrible reputation. So I went to get my hair cut across the street from the bank after being there for a couple months. I get my hair cut and colored every three months, so that's the little secret about me. And I go across the street in our little quaint downtown, and a lady is cutting my hair, and she asked me why I moved back to Edmond. And I said, oh, I'm working at Citizens Bank of Edmond. And she literally takes her um, scissors and puts them down and says, you need to be careful. There's a lady that works there that's evil. And I said, well, I think you're talking about me. <laughs> and she's like, no, you're sweet. And I'm like, no, you're definitely talking about me. And so I went a couple months later to Nichols Hills, which is across town from Edmond. I get my hair cut there, and the guy is cutting my hair and says, hey, 
obliging me to Edmund, and I'm trying to like go all the way around it so I don't reveal that I'm working at Citizens Bank with Edmund. Whenever I finally say that I am, he's like, oh, girl, you better be careful. There's a girl that works there that I hear for is quite evil. And he I actually cut hair from one of my board director's kids. I mean, the town did not like me. My board did not like me. The staff despised me. They were all, you know, I had ruined their, this, um, this great thing they had going. Everybody was getting lots of great gifts. They had a management team that they loved. And all of that was destroyed because of me coming into town. So once we were released from the written agreement, it was like a switch all of a sudden happened with my management style. I was always a really collaborative leader, but whenever you're in a turnaround, you're, you're, in, um, you're in dictator mode. You're you know, cutting, you're, you're putting people in slots of good and evil, and you get, trying to get rid of as much bad, whether it's customers or employees or systems or whatever it may be, and really focus on the good. But that has to stop at some point in time. So the board, after we recovered, um, puts me in the CEO position, and I actually tell them, like, like, I don't think I can lead this bank because I've been leading it through this turnaround. Like, I don't know if I can take it like into the future. And they assured me that they thought I could do it. So um, I went full ahead and said, okay, this is, I'm going to go back into my, my normal shoes and be the collaborator leader that I love being. And so um, I was there, but the team, I mean, it was like you, you have a little a dog that you adopt that's been abused, and, and it, every time you go to reach for it, that it's like ducking down because it's afraid you're going to hurt them. Well, that's like how my whole entire team was, except I was kind of the abuser in this situation before and be like, oh, no, and now I'm not going to, I'm going to pet you now. And so it was really a strange dynamic and one in which has taken us a long time to recover from. Turning around a bank, give me a bank to turn around any day of the week, turning around culture is super difficult and then taking a culture in which employees and team members are fearful of the leader and the consequences of failure where failure we literally would say failure was not an option to now going to where it's okay to fail I promise you I won't hurt you if you fail I mean it's really difficult to make that leap but our, we are slowly but surely um, doing that and what we really have focused is just let's be accessible to customers let's not have any kind of, of ego and how we interact with the community and my favorite saying is your ego is not your amigo and um, let's be on the first floor let's not have an office let's be completely accessible to the customer I provide customers uh, on social media my cell phone all the time and social really, really was kind of the gateway drug to this accessibility. So we didn't have marketing. We only had you know, a shoestring budget, so we couldn't advertise. But I knew like being accessible and, and just interacting. And I would search for, I know there's other citizens' banks in here. I would um, search for citizens' bank sucks on Twitter. And, and our little bank is like one of 120 citizens' bank throughout the nation. And we're one of the smallest citizens' bank. But when I search for citizens' bank sucks, on Twitter, just about everybody that said that lived in Edmond, Oklahoma. <laughs> like, no lie. And so, but what I have found is even if they, if they said that two years ago, if I would interact with them, then suddenly the next time someone says Citizens Bank sucks, that same person that I talked to would jump in and say, oh no, you need to talk to Jill, she's going to take care of this. And slowly but surely, we started building this community online that were advocates for us, that were raving fans for us, even though we really weren't doing anything other than being accessible and engaging with them them at the highest level. The first thing I did with my staff to try to bribe them to like me is I gave them each $5 to go to the store across the street, a little cute stationery store, to spend money there. And I thought, well, I'll have them wear citizens' t-shirts, I'll give them a certificate, I'll coordinate with the small business, and then the teams will take pictures of them buying something at the small business and we'll post it on social media. And this should help them like, like me better. What ended up happening, that was really shallow and short-sighted, but what happened was is that it really started instilling this pride, these cash mobs that we started six years ago and now have more than 60 of these, and our staff loves them. They post about it, the working at Citizens Bank of Edmond, all within the confines of our social media policy, on their own social media, and it's brought people into the fold of wanting to work at our bank. It's made us known as a social, the um, small business advocate, small business partner in the Oklahoma community and the very first one we did um, I couldn't buy like a one inch by one inch ad in the paper at this time we had no advertising bucket bu budget but this um, but this cash model this very first one was on the front page of the business section of the daily Oklahoma in our largest state newspaper 
full color with a, the shop owner, a dog, like a puppy, like you can't even buy this stuff, it's crazy. And our staff around them with a sign that says, we love Citizens Bank, and the whole article about how Citizens is a social media lead, or a small business leader. Um, and the, the staff had gone on to replicate this online. We have a waiting list of businesses that want to be mauled by us. It may be difficult to see, but um, the, we have a, a, an event called H and Eighth in downtown Oklahoma City. It's the largest food truck festival in the nation. It happened once a month. Now it's a once a year phenomenon, but it was happening once a month, and 45,000 people would come and converge on this little part of Oklahoma City that was really depressed, and it, but it, it ended up turning this area around and causing all this economic vitality that uh, really turned it into something extraordinary. Well, this food truck event was happening. We are in the suburbs. This is in an urban core. We're in the affluent suburb. This is like the gritty urban core, like two, couldn't be further away from each other, both geographically as well as just philosophically and just how things, are, how we're perceived. But um, I've been working with them and saying, like, if there's anything we can ever do to help H and H out, we're there for you. And they're like, oh no, we partner with a large regional bank. We don't need citizens. Well, then they tweet out, uh, hey, unfortunately, peeps, you're going to need to bring your cash uh, to h and because our ATMs are down. We won't have ATMs. And I said, hey, if, let me know if it, Citizens Bank can ever help with that. Well, they send me a direct message. This is on a Wednesday, and the event is on, thir on Friday that says, if you can get ATMs here uh, by Friday, you guys can be a lead sponsor of our event, and you can be fully integrated into the h and experience. And I was like, oh, yeah, we'll get ATMs there. Okay, we do not have like a stockpile of like mobile ATMs to get anywhere, but our ha staff like hustled and made it where we were able to partner with a third party to get ATMs there, and these were the very first ones that we put out in two days, wrapped with our logo with, um, with the third party vendor providing that. Elemental Coffee is this really cool coffee shop in that same area, and they're the ones that started h and i I'm gonna come back to them, but um, Laura, who owns LML Coffee, has basically transformed a section of Oklahoma City into the place to live, into the place to put your office, into the place to have a retail establishment. All the great eateries, all the great vitality that's happening in Oklahoma City is happening in Midtown, and it really started with this coffee shop and h and so everybody started engaging with us on social media about, let, well, hey, we love that you're doing H and Eighth, but why can't we have something like this in Edmond? Well, Edmond is not known for like a place with food trucks. Wherever you're from, think about the ritziest place that you're from. And because the food trucks would say, we are not, we're not going to come to Edmond. The people in Edmond want to sit inside and eat. They do not want to sit on the street and eat at the, with the food truck. So we think, well, let's put a food truck event together. We'll guarantee that 500 people show up. We decided to close down our, our, the street in front of the bank, and we had five food trucks kind of dropped off this, this cliff with us, and we hired three local bands to play, and we had about a dozen small businesses pop-up tents right in front of the bank, um, the street right in front of the bank. In this area of town, in Emmon, even though it's very affluent, um, it's kind of a forgotten um, historic downtown. Empty storefronts, the rents is, are about $6 a square foot at this time. Very inexpensive to have um, have businesses there, but the businesses then didn't have to produce a lot of income in order to be successful to pay for the rents, and it just kind of was a cycle of not being a really successful part of our city, and it's where our bank was located. Uh, so we started H and Eight. I mean, heard on heard, and the very first one, instead of 500 people showing up, 3,000 people showed up. We only promoted it via social media as the bank planning this this food truck local music event. And we started this about five and a half years ago, and it's extraordinary what's been happening now. In March, uh, so we do this eight times a year, and we do it on third Saturday. So if you're ever in Oklahoma City area, uh, I will give you the backstage pass. We do three local bands, three dozen food trucks, three dozen pop-up shops. We have a waiting list on all three of those things. We are really known as the local music curator of the Oklahoma City Metro. Our staff plans it. We've had over a million people attend this event. As in, this is like a bank community appreciation day, as if they buy their own food. And we only use social media to promote it. And we have gotten more deposits and loans from this event than anything we've ever done. It costs us about $45,000 a year to put it on. We've been able to quantify the economic impact, and it's 30, over $35 million since we in, in the inception of Herd on Herd. And we won an Urban Land Institute award for this, um, an Urban Land Institute celebrates development of the urban core. And we were a suburban bank putting on a party and won a ULI award for it there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> My table is very supportive. <laughs> so here's a little bit of video of what Herd on Herd looks like. Thank you.
And so this is, um, it's just a really great event. And when I walk through the streets, I have the community coming around me and saying, thank you so much for building our community. Um, the merchants, um, many of them have said, thank you for, um, this is downtown Evan 2.0. And now we see rents have gone up to almost $30 a square foot. Um, there's over $100 million of development that's planned in the urban core, of uh, the suburban urban core, um, and that was not on the, on the pay, on, in the, the, the plan previously, and every single chamber of commerce meeting I go to, and every single city council meeting I go to, where they're asked, "Why are you bringing your development into downtown Edmond?" They always say, "I saw her on her, and I knew that was something special here in downtown Edmond." So Elemental Coffee said that they want to start banking with us. So um, Laura is in the urban core of Oklahoma City, reaches out and says, we want to start banking with you. We're 30 miles away. She has to pass dozens of banks to get to us. I'm like, this is kind of silly. So, Laura, you're going to have to go back and forth. She's like, I'm going to do it. I align with what you're doing socially. I want to build a community with you all. So I said, well, what if we just like built something around you to help you here? And so by branches, my philosophy on branching is I'm not branching over my dead body. I'm not doing it again. We have one branch, and that's all I'm going to have. But what we decided to do is put together a little automated, uh, what I thought was just going to be like an ITM that I bought and, and some, maybe some other off-the-shelf banking products I could put together for Laura and just use a couple hundred square feet in her, her space or someplace close by and that she could conduct her cash and coin relay business because she still has quite a bit of that. And I couldn't find anything. So what we ended up doing was developing our own and from in, in a time frame of eight months, from that conversation with Laura to opening, we have now Midtown Bank, which is an electronic banking facility. It's completely um, self-service from a customer standpoint. They're able to get rolled coin, deposit bulk coin, and there's an interactive teller machine that's there, but that's not really the reliance of the technology. And we have a large um, cash and coin that, uh, processor that they can do change orders, get the denominations they need, they can deposit, and all of that is directly um, integrated into our core, so it's not going on ACH lines or ATM lines, and um, it's just uniquely to us. We also have the capability to offer this to non-customers, we haven't opened it up yet, and we, um, and we can ACH deposits that, cu that customers make cash deposits to us to ACH elsewhere. Of course, we, we are rigorous in our BSA and ALM, um, and AML to ensure that we're complying with everything that we need to. It has uh, Wi-Fi in here, um, wireless charging stations, places where Laura can go and interview staff if she needs to. And we file for our first patent. So we, uh, our 55 team members developed this and then uh, February this year we filed for our first patent and they're actually about to file for another patent um, on this technology. And that led to us collaborating with several other community leaders to uh, reinvigorate the 23rd Street Corridor, which is a majority minority um, community um, in the, near the urban core. And this is a former porn theater that now is transformed to the economic centerpiece of this really distressed part of town that now is incredibly vibrant. This is, and so with, um, with us, we have our Citizens Bank of Edmond presents, and we are, again, this is the urban core, and we're out in the suburbs, and the, the community here has accepted us as one of their own, even though we would seem like we're a foreigner by being in the suburbs. They really, Citizens Bank of Edmond has got the brand acceptance to the point that they, it's now considered like a top shelf brand um, in this area of town and in the urban core. I mentioned before we consolidated our six locations. We had two locations less than a block away from each other. I don't know why they did that, but they did. And um, this whole block here was one bank branch. It's about 60,000 square feet. And this one over here is about 20,000 square feet. I've consolidated everyone into that office there, but it left all this space empty. Uh, whenever we did the consolidation, so back, and I know you, ITMs is kind of, I mean, I don't even think they're very, it, it, the, I don't really like the technology very much, but back in 2013 when we consolidated our bank branches, we were unable to buy an ITM machine. I thought I was going to be able to place one across the street from the band branches that I was consolidating, and the customers basically could use it like a virtual drive through I couldn't receive, when I found out that I went, couldn't buy this technology, which was about six weeks before we were supposed to execute the sale, and I decided to create it myself. And so we basically did FaceTime at the ATM. This is the, the minimally viable product that we got launched in six weeks for $15,000. And we did this in six of the locations. So all our drive-up ATMs had the ability to interact with the drive through teller back at our main bank branch, as well as to do videos on how to um, make a deposit at the ATM, get recommendations from our staff on where to eat and things like that. 
We also uh, renovated our bank branch, so that really, that 20,000 square foot bank branch, we took it back to what it looked like in 1968, and so we have polka dots on the floor, that's all original. We have no offices, we have pods that we designed, we um, partnered with our core to uh, implement technology that hadn't been done in a bank branch before. We have secure Wi-Fi for our staff, we all have um, surfaces, and then our customers have a Wi-Fi that they can also use. And, and uh, we will have businesses meeting regularly in our bank lobby. We also have a robotic coffee machine that I imported from Denmark. Um, it's one of, the only, there's one of the few that's in the United States like it, um, but it's really popular. Our, our customers can actually order their coffee before they come to the bank, and we can have it prepared for them according to how, what they want. Um, this is a little video of the bank, but um, it's just to give you a perspective, um, I was just telling my group um, here, I, I was hit by a car in that intersection, a truck actually, like two months ago, walking across that, that, um, that crosswalk, so it's kind of horrifying to look at it from this perspective, so we won't show that video. Um, and so our bank branch, too, is very community-centered. So we have this uh, really awesome community calendar where we have an artist come in, and sometimes we'll actually group, uh, crowdsource the art for this, um, this lobby art that's very functional and that it's a community lobby is showing everything happening in Oklahoma City and Edmond. Uh, for the month, and then we will use this also on social media and tag everyone, and so it just gets a lot of views and engagement and is really relied upon throughout our community to showcase the cool stuff happening. It shows uh, midtown before, sorry. Um, and then so this remaining building that has the 40,000 square feet, so that was empty, and I was lucky enough to go and speak at different places around the nation, and I would land at different co-working spaces, and I went to Rise in New York City, and was really blown away by how they were utilizing the space. And I, I, all I could do when I was in there was think about this excess space that we had. And this, this was a... Um, this is crown molding, so this, the brown you see at the top looks like it's a ceiling, but it's actually crown molding. So the previous management had acquired a 12,000 square foot building and was planning to use it for just executive office space. Again, we were a $350 million bank. We did not need 12,000 square feet of executive office space. But that's what they had it done for. I said I would never um, occupy this space. We bought it in 2009, right when I got here, and it had, it had gotten renovated to this point. And so I, I didn't know what to do with it. I couldn't rent it for very much because this was back when downtown Edmond was not doing very well. So we didn't have co-working in the Oklahoma City metropolitan area. So we launched co-working spaces. And three months before our actual former launch, we were full with the space. And now it cash flows at $24,000 a month. And for a little bank our size, that's pretty big time. It covers all of our occupancy costs. Because they put so much money in this building and the downtown area was depressed, um, I, was, I couldn't sell it without taking a huge hit to capital. Well, now as real estate prices have increased in downtown and we've got this cash flowing, then we're kind of bringing it up to the point that this might be something that we can sell someday. But if it keeps making more and more money, then it's something that potentially we could hold on to. The difference with the co-working space from a traditional standpoint versus how we use this is this is actually bank premises. Our customers are the only ones that have access to this co-working space. So our customers have free access to a podcast studio. They have the different hours based upon the type of account they have that they can use meeting spaces. They get free co-working spaces based upon their account types. And then they have the ability based upon different other factors to reserve office space there as well. We have 100 members there as well, too. So. And then finally, the, the very corner of this space, so this space right here, um, was the former CEO had carved out 2,000 square feet just for him. It had wine storage. It had a view of downtown. It was as far away from our bank branch. I'm not judging anyone for trying not to. Uh, our bank lobby was here and his office was there. Um, it had a little escape um, door so he could get out, but it didn't have a handle to get in. I hated this space, like hated it. So we transformed all the space to co-working space except for that one piece, and I hated it. I didn't know what to do with it. I knew it needed to be something special, but I just did not like it. So then I get a tweet, and Steve Blackmire writes about the urban core of what's happening in development in the urban core. I've got 25 seconds left, so sorry I'm going a little fast. Um, but he writes about the urban core and things that are happening there, and he tweets at me, and this is at night on like a Thursday. Uh, if I were Jill, I'd be talking to, citizen, to Urban Agrarian. Urban Agrarian is a urban um, grocery store in downtown Oklahoma City. They announced on Twitter that they were closing, 
And I went to meet with them, and they're like, we are closing. We're really frustrated. We don't know how to really create a market for our goods. We had this vision that if we only had like 1,500 square feet, preferably in downtown Edmond, on like this corner, and we would just, it would be perfect for us. And we have this equipment that we bought, and it's like curved glass, like bistro style, um, like um, butcher um, display. And, and I'm like, think, all I'm thinking about is, oh my goodness, this space maybe is meant for them. Well, it ends up, and this is a year later, um, that they are launching their space in downtown Edmond in that former um, CEO office space. It's now a grocery store. And if you know, if you read, there's so much research on grocery stores. If you have a local grocery store, it really lifts up a community. It increases property values and creates a great sense of community. Thank you so much for having me here today.